Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On today's episode, Ash Sorrells joins us to discuss the Autism Campus Inclusion Conference, being a doctoral student in philosophy and 10 Rules of Love. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Ash? Thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. Great to be here. I wanted to start off by learning about your story and where would you say that story begins within the autistic community? So, and like thinking about this question beforehand, I was a little tripped up on this one word, uh, community, because my answer could sort of diverge in two ways, depending on how we look at that. One, uh, my origins in autism, like my autistic origins, uh, and two, my origins in the autistic culture and institutions that arose with the experiences of autistic people. So for the first, according to my mom, I uh, hand flapped really early on, but she called it writing in the air. (laughs) We're from a small town, Athens, Arkansas. So there wasn't much info in the 90s on autism that wasn't being rerouted through like uh, local physicians or something like that. And because of that, I wasn't actually formally diagnosed until a couple years ago. But I, way before that, came to recognize myself as autistic over time, especially in encountering the autistic community on Tumblr and in Julia Bascom's uh, really great edited volume, Loud Hands. My involvement in the community then grew after I self-identified as autistic, and I uh, began a group at the seminary that I was going to after undergrad called Bright Divinity School. This group was called Divergence. And Divergence was a space for disabled and neurodivergent students at the seminary to share their uninterrupted experiences uh, in an open format, to allow us to build connections with each other on campus, and to engage in uh, political activity if we needed to. And this led me to writing on autistic theology and also applying to become a fellow with the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And talking about the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, I read that you participated in their Autistic Camp Campus Inclusion Conference in 2018. And I read that you said the conference changed your life. So I see that applications are now being accepted for the 2024 conference. So what would be some reasons why you would tell people why they should apply for the conference? So ACI was wonderful. I, I it did really change my life. It helped me like really understand myself in an important way. But uh, the thing that I think is important here is um, we need more autistic people to experience autistic connection and community and world building in person uh, with one another. Or, I mean, not necessarily in person, we are using Zoom at this point, but like engage directly with one another. And I think there's two important reasons that we need people to do this in places like ACI. So one, we need autistic people who are building those connections amongst one another to better understand ourselves and see the potential that we have as autistic people. So a listic or non-autistic society likes to suppress autistic potential. If it is ever expressed in a way that isn't amenable to like a listic norms or expectations of what we should be like. So we need autistic people working together to build our own understanding of how we should operate the world based on our own needs and desires to understand ourselves rather than trying to understand ourselves through the prisms of another person, uh, through non-autistic people. And then two, we need people that are not only doing this kind of exploration, but doing it in the context of the history of the disability rights movement and the practical skills that are useful in making change. So we need both to see what an autistic future could look like, but also how to make that happen and to make connections to make it happen. So it is a project that's both individual and social. And I think that ACI is a really good place to get started on that. Now, currently you're in the process of getting your PhD and I've, and have been a graduate uh, teaching assistant and tutor. So what are some things that you've done or think would be helpful for teachers to do in supporting their autistic students? 
the first thing I think that non-autistic teachers in particular, but also autistic teachers, because we're still like re-understanding ourselves, uh, need to understand is that especially non-autistic people don't understand autism and autistic people were still learning it. The thing is an issue because many autistic people think that they do understand autism. They see blurbs and condensed information on social media or in really destructive situations, they hear it through hate groups like Autism Speaks. But this is a version of autism that non-autistic people have made about us. It's uh, not one that we've built for ourselves. And you can't really start helping your autistic students until you recognize that you don't have that knowledge and that you need to listen to autistic people ourselves to like directly engage with us and be open to us. So this means getting rid of old academic expectations about how the body operates in classrooms, which are generally built to define what kinds of bodies, what kinds of people can be there or not be there, how we can succeed or not succeed. So this might mean letting students STEM. It might mean letting students use uh, AAC. It might mean letting students sit or lay on the floor if they need to and it is safe letting students use technology to type notes, et cetera, et cetera. I'm getting rid of the expectations of what academia has to look like because it's always based on like what bodies should look like or should operate as. So it's important to listen to the autistic students in your class and take our needs very seriously. It's not the time for non-autistic people to decide what our needs are. Instead, we're the ones who decide and we need assistance from non-autistic people to get the things that we need to thrive. Now, I saw at the top of your Instagram account that you describe yourself as a philosophy weirdo. So I love talking with uh, philosophy uh, weirdos because when I was younger, I read or at least attempted to read a good amount of philosophy. So what part of philosophy do you feel most connected with? I call myself a philosophy weirdo on Instagram, but I have been taking to calling myself an anti-philosopher on my blog. Uh, the reason for this is I think that philosophy is too bound up in its own rules. So philosophy has the potential, and this is what I think is really beautiful about philosophy, to change the way we think, and in doing that to change the way that we act in the world, to change the world. But it can't do that so long it's locked in this pattern that uh, Western academic institutions have called, quote unquote, philosophy. So the best part of philosophy is that it can open a path outside of or beyond philosophy to so new types of thinking about the world that also allow us to change the world. So because of this, I tend to love philosophers that I think are helping us with that type of thinking. My favorite philosopher is Ludwig Wittgenstein, who I think uh, is really, really adept at doing this. But many of philosophers are doing that. Remy Yergo at the uh, University of Michigan is an example of an autistic theorist working in academia that isn't typically categorized as a philosopher, uh, they work in rhetoric, but they do provide autistic people a better way to think about our experience and ways to build an autistic future. In doing that, they like move beyond the ways that we might conventionally use theory or philosophical thinking. Their book, Authoring Autism, I think is particularly worth reading in that regard. We mentioned earlier that you're getting your PhD, and from what I understand, this degree will be in, in philosophy. So what do you hope to do once you're Dr. Ash? Many, many things. Um, <laughs> at the top of my blog, it says to do one thing today and another tomorrow. That's actually a quote from Karl Marx. But <laughs> it's uh, supposed to mean that like you can do many things, that like lives aren't supposed to be like one specific avenue of being, but instead our lives can be multivariate and pluralistic. So there are pathways to an academic career that I might take or could take, but I'm not sold on academia being where philosophy should always be. So I want my writing to do things, but only one of those things is to be read and to be taught. I want it to like be out in the world in some sense, in some way. I also don't want to tie myself to writing forever, especially not commercial writing. So my PhD work is a path, but it's a path that leads to many other possible paths which is a very like uh, I think ambiguous way for me to say like I'm considering many things <laughs> and I think that one of those might be working in academia but also like there are many other paths that I might take. I do love that quote because I think as autistic people we tend to not fit into boxes really well 
And I think a lot of times our creativity leads, you know, we start out on one thing and then you go to another thing and another, and they could all be around a theme or, you know, around a theme of, of your life. But I think a lot of times like having that box of like one particular thing doesn't work too well. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to, you mentioned about your blog and I wanted to ask you about your blog, Fish in the Afternoon. I'm particularly interested in one of your blog posts that I saw titled 10 Maxims on Love. As these days, I'm really thinking about the importance of love and how to seek that out in my life. You know, I'm thinking, really been thinking about how love is life and just kind of the rest of life is just details. So what was your inspiration to share these 10 rules of love with the world? In that post, when I'm talking about love, I'm talking about love and it's like multivaried expressions. Um, I think there's a tendency in this culture to think about love only in the context of like romantic situations. But I'm not just talking about love with a romantic partner. That is definitely included. But love is this pluralistic thing that occurs in many different kinds of relationships. What I would say love is, is attending to the unfolding of another. What I mean by that is in our non-loving relationships with others, by which I don't mean hateful, just outside of love, not like a part of our loving intention. We encounter people as obstacles on our path or as just parts of our path. We see them as one step to something else. So what the philosopher Immanuel Kant would call a means to an end. And love, I think, is supposed to change that. In love, we stop seeing others as part of our path, but as their own fully realized lives. The philosopher Iris Murdoch in Sovereignty of Good defines love as the really difficult realization that something or someone other than yourself is real. It's like encountering that realness. So the 10 maxims are supposed to be strategies for entering that state of love and practicing it in the many different kinds of relationships that you find yourself in or that you make with another person or with other people. The different relationships are gonna be distinct in their content. No relationships ever the same as the other ones. But in all cases, love, that taking another as fully who they are in themselves and existing just as ourselves with another person, that helps us to see others as fully human, fully fleshed out, fully like valuable. And hopefully in doing this and taking this stance towards uh, other people in our uh, romantic relationships, in our friendships, in our family relationships, in our uh, relationships at work, through recognizing that we can then help other people to be fully realized versions of themselves in a way that doesn't attach our own expectations onto them. And hopefully, ideally, that's reciprocal, that people do this with us as well, so that we are all attending to the unfolding of each other so we can be fully realized human beings. So to me, those 10 maxims of love that I talk about in that post are supposed to be like just steps to practice over time to help you get in that mindset with other people. And where can our listeners go to read your blog? So uh, you can read my work at uh, fishintheafternoon.com. I recently made a where to start page to help frame reading the blog, considering that many of these works build on one another. There's kind of its own mythology and how that I am constructing the blog. So it can be hard to wade through. So I've tried to like help readers along that path. I do want to note for the audience that the subject matter can be very surrealistic, very like densely philosophical and political. It can sometimes be upsetting or explicit. So it's, it's meant to be a work of art and philosophy. So it's not really going to find like practical tips about uh, <laughs> autism or anything similar. But I, I do hope that um, people who read it find a lot to think about and a lot to love in it. Well, that was one of the things that I thought about when reading your blog was it made me think more than the, the uh, traditional blog that I often read. So that was enjoyable to kind of reflect back to my 20s when I would uh, read some of the philosophers that you talked about, you know, in our in our discussion. And it was it was very enjoyable. So thanks for making me think a little bit more than I normally do. Absolutely. I'm glad that that was uh, your experience. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining me today, Ash. Uh, it was wonderful to uh, connect with you and uh, learn a little bit about your life. Thank you. It's, uh, it was great to be here. 
We always love hearing from you and would especially love to hear from you relating to this episode on how you're choosing love in your life today. Thanks so much to Ash for the conversation. To learn more about Ash and their blog, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. Here at Autism Personal Coach, our clients are the experts, our coaches are the guides. The majority of supports for our autistics are not helpful. They try to fix us, not support us. That's why many are confused when we say our clients are the experts, experts of their lived experience. Our clients are the experts for what has worked for them and about the things they need and want in their lives. Our coaches first listen to our clients and then ask thoughtful questions, offer resources, and strategize with our clients so they can get what they need to thrive. Would you want a guide in your life to coach you to get you the things you desire? If so, then visit AutismPersonalCoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.